You can't believe it. You can't imagine it. What they did here, mm. nobody can. Piece they build it. a big wall. Mm -hmm. They said to us, 40, 40 uh, meters in the ground with the sensors that nobody can. And six meters uh, up. They said this will protect you. Yeah. We believe that, that this can protect us. They just broke through. They came through. They came through. fighters from the Palestinian militant group Hamas broke through the 20-foot high barrier that has long separated Israel from the Gaza Strip, a densely populated enclave that is home to more than 2 million people. The 40-mile long barrier is outfitted with cutting-edge surveillance tools, a deep underground concrete layer to block Hamas tunnels, and remote control machine guns above ground. After a billion dollar upgrade in 2021, Israeli officials dubbed it the Iron Wall. But in a matter of minutes, Hamas was able to breach the fence in around 30 locations, the start of what would become the deadliest single assault in Israel's history. Around 1,200 people were killed, 240 taken hostage. The attack triggered a catastrophic war in Gaza that has killed thousands of Palestinians so far. Israel has vowed to destroy Hamas, which has controlled the territory for years. Broadly, the fighters entered at 6.40 a.m. Uh -huh. That's the same incident, just from the other side of the street. Exactly. Soon after the October 7th attack, the Washington Post began investigating how the so-called Iron Wall could have failed so spectacularly. Our team of reporters analyzed hundreds of videos, photos, and audio recordings from before, during, and after the attack. With Frontline, we spoke with witnesses on the ground. We got hit with the first RPG. We examined maps and planning documents recovered from Hamas fighters. We took the visual evidence from October 7th and mapped it across southern Israel and inside the Gaza Strip, sometimes using the position of the sun to estimate when key events occurred. What we found was a fragile barrier that gave Israel a false sense of security, leaving it blind to its own vulnerabilities and to the meticulous plan taking shape on the other side of the fence. The attack began at dawn, around 6.15 a.m. Videos recovered from Hamas fighters show them setting off from Gaza and heading towards the fence, which has long been resented by Gazans who've been penned in by it. People along the road cheered them on. Around 6.30, as fighters made their way to the fence, Hamas began firing a barrage of thousands of rockets at targets across the barrier. In just the first five minutes of the attack, there were red alerts for more than 30 communities near the Israeli side of the wall. In Kibbutz Erez, less than a mile from the barrier, Ben Sadan, a member of the community security, had just woken up for an early morning bike ride. <laughs> So over there we can see Gaza? Yeah. Yeah. And the, the security fence, you yeah. can see it running along there, and there's the towers with the machine gun. Yeah. This is the border. Yeah. On the, on the left side, it's Gaza. On the right side, Yishuv Israeli. And I think... Some of the earliest rockets came over just around all here. All around, yeah. all around. We're looking here and we're seeing everything, everything. Rockets to the south, rockets that are falling here, the smarts, everything, everything, everything. All the sky is burning, really burning. 
From this hilltop, the next wave of Hamas's attack became visible. Reconnaissance fighters on paragliders soaring over the wall under cover from the rockets. Videos we obtained show them landing in communities inside Israel, the culmination of a plan that had been years in the making, and that, as we discovered, had been brewing in plain sight. When I first saw this video, I was like, oh, this is video from the day of. Like, how did they get this produced out so quickly? And then once you look closer, go, it's obviously a training video. Our investigation found multiple videos recorded by Hamas detailing their planning measures. Some were posted on social media before the attack, visible to all. We found videos of militants training for attacks on mock-ups of Israeli compounds. Videos posted soon after the attack showed they had also been practicing the use of paragliders. Hamas had also been expanding their training camps, activity that was visible in widely available online maps. But this evidence was largely ignored or dismissed by Israeli intelligence and the military, our investigation found. Michael Milstein is a former head of the Palestinian Department for Israel's military intelligence. He has been strongly critical of their missteps leading up to October 7th. Israel knew about, about the whole plans because, you know, Hamas didn't uh, hide them. It was on, on public, on their internet sites, on their TV, everywhere. From the operational tactic point of view, October the 7th, we, we, Israel IDF didn't uh, uh, face any, any surprise over there. Were there specific warnings that something like this could be coming? Well, according to the reports in the Israeli media, there was a very focused uh, reports about the whole plan, the whole, the whole offensive plan that uh, promoted. And uh, actually, uh, the data, the reports itself were known, even to senior ranks, senior figures in IDF intelligence. But the basic assumption, the basic assessment in, uh, in the intelligence was that uh, those are only trainings or a, a, a theoretic, theoretic uh, uh, attempts, but the, we are not speaking about something which is very uh, feasible. of Hamas's operation on October 7th was the stage that their videos called the blinding plan, aimed at severing the connections to Israel's surveillance and security system. Israel uses seven Skystar surveillance balloons to monitor hotspots along the Gaza fence. The balloons carry a long-range 360-degree camera, but the model of camera that Israel uses on the balloons is relatively old and is no longer made. On the morning of October 7th, we found that three of the seven balloons were in need of maintenance and out of service. Video from the attack shows one of the remaining balloons. We were told it had been cut loose by the militants. The balloons are part of a system that includes surveillance and weapons towers. Visuals and other data from the towers are fed into monitoring centers inside Israel, including one near Raim. It doesn't matter how many combat soldiers they are, if they don't know where the enemy is, they can't fight the enemy. Rotem Horowitz spent two years monitoring the camera feeds at Raim before completing her military service last spring. Three of the balloons were out of service on the day they weren't working. Mm -hmm. The cameras needed to be repaired, but they're old and out of production. Yeah, so... Is that a big problem? I personally think it is. They were first brought into use in 2006, and ever since then, it's kind of been the same system. It doesn't work very well during rough weather, like only when weather conditions are perfect. Do you remember people sending up warnings that, you know, these balloons are getting out of date, some of them aren't working, they're not working in bad weather? Yeah, um, I know that the surveillance operators on the balloon have, as long as I've been there, you know, I served there, um, we've been complaining about how the balloons see and, like, in general, their quality ever since I can remember. The balloons are supplemented by surveillance towers containing HD cameras. 
laser and infrared sensors and radar and can see people for almost six miles away, according to the manufacturer. Other structures called Sentry Tech Towers are topped with Samson weapon stations, which feature machine guns and sensors. They're positioned every few hundred yards along the barrier and outside key military facilities, and are nicknamed Roe Yore, Hebrew for seas, fires. Once the sensors send an intruder alert, IDF personnel can fire the 50 caliber machine guns by remote control. We have to really make sure that we can firmly see a weapon and a threat before we can actually do anything with it. So usually, like if someone's getting close to the fence, we use it to kind of not shoot at them, but shoot near them to kind of like scare them away. Like, don't come close. You know, we're not going to touch them if they don't come close. The moment they're showing that they're a threat and they're coming close, that's when we start to act. Video from one of the sentry towers on October 7th shows it firing on a group of Hamas fighters as they approach the fence near Kisufim. But that's not what happened elsewhere. Hamas fighters had come prepared to evade the towers and documents recovered after the attack reveal a deep and detailed knowledge of Israeli defenses. In this one, they specifically note the locations of surveillance systems. Fighters also carry with them open source satellite imagery annotated with coded locations of key structures along the wall. Armed with this information, Hamas carried out their blinding plan using unmanned drones equipped with cameras to drop explosives on installations like this surveillance tower near the community of Behri. Of the Sentry Tech Towers marked on the map, we verified videos of at least two of them being attacked. This one, located near Kfar Aza, was attacked twice by Hamas drones. Incendiary explosive devices with fuses were dropped on the camera and weapon system. Some of the training videos we found posted online show that these drone maneuvers had been well rehearsed. Other videos from the 7th show towers being attacked with rocket-propelled grenades and gunfire. It's hard to tell just from the video evidence how badly damaged the installations were. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming and seeing us tonight. But retired Colonel Danny Tirza, the former head of the Israeli military's fence administration, told me Hamas's blinding plan drastically undermined Israel's ability to respond to the attack. That was a real, a real failure because they succeeded to cut the command system. The command system of all this area mm -hmm. was built on one control system and they succeeded to cut it and therefore we couldn't use helicopters because according to the israeli system the helicopters cannot shoot if there is no someone on the ground that showed them where are your forces where the other side forces so they came but they couldn't shoot because they didn't know who and what is going on there in 2021 when the latest upgrade was unveiled. Some of the political and military leaders made very firm, quite bold claims for the barrier. They said, this will protect the residents in the south. Hamas will not get in. And was that a mistake to, to promise those things? Of course, it was a mistake. We really thought that we're building a very good infrastructure that will help to save the lives of the Israelis Unfortunately, it didn't work. He said the attack exposed a fundamental misconception about the fence. It was built against people that will try to cross it. It wasn't built against army or against a lot of people that are coming in one time. Were you surprised, you personally surprised, at how quickly they were able to blast through and, and make it into the bases and, and beyond? I myself was not surprised that they cross it so quickly because the fence is not built for such frightening. It was built for another thing. If you want to stop an army, you are doing it with army tools. If you want to stop one, two, three terrorists, 
You are doing it with soft tools like what we did. We didn't thought that there will come a terror army from the other side. They were crossing at the same time, big groups, and we were not prepared for it. The Israeli government says Hamas broke through the fence in around 30 locations. We obtained videos from 14 of them. The videos show trained Hamas fighters using explosives and munitions to blow holes in the fence and its concrete barriers. It took them only minutes. By around 6.40 a.m., Israel's iron wall had largely crumbled. In the weeks that have followed, Israel's military and intelligence establishments have come under intense criticism. A spokesman for the Israeli Defense Forces, Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner, agreed to speak with me at a military base in Tel Aviv. Hamas has published several training videos which appear to show fighters in the months before practicing specific tactics that were then used on the day, blowing up fences, paragliding, and so on. Did Israel not see this? I mean, we're looking at what exactly transpired before the 7th of October, and there will be a time when the IDF will be doing that soul-searching that is required. And the IDF will review that, and those that need to take uh, responsibility will have to take responsibility. What do you think October 7th says about the integrity of that barrier? So the barrier itself is a concept that was uh, perceived to be a strong line of defense. But any line of defense it can only withhold a certain amount of pressure. I think the question is not necessarily what is the barrier, but what was the threat assessment? And these are the types of questions that we will be asking. These are the types of questions that the, the answers to the residents of those towns of the Kibbutzim, we owe them uh, clarification and, and, and uh, you know, accountability for the failure of not defense, but the whole concept of operations. And this, I think, is what the IDF will be looking into when, we, when, when the war is over. The Hamas fighters that broke through the fence that morning were bound for the military bases and communities along the border. One group headed for Kibbutz Erez where Ben Sadan and the rest of his security team had already armed themselves and watched with dismay as the fighters kept coming. And they're carrying weapons? What kind of things are they carrying? Um, AK-47, RPG, grenade. How many of them were there? How many of your men were there? They were in between 20 to 30 soldiers with a gun and a gun. It was a great deal. We were in the stage of eight. 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 He told me the combat lasted three hours. After these few hours of fighting, what happened next? Go to pbs.org slash frontline for more coverage of the ongoing conflict from our partners at the Washington Post and more from Frontline, including selected interviews. Is this a place where I can have a tomorrow? You cannot ignore the Palestinian people. Connect with Frontline on Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly Twitter, and stream anytime on the PBS app 
YouTube, or pbs.org/frontline. The impact of the 